Book One of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo. Shadow and Bone. Chapter 21. I picked up my dinner and then lay down on my cot again, turning over the things that Jenny had said. Jenny had spent nearly her entire life cloistered away in Osalta, existing uneasily between the world of the Grisha and the intrigues of the court. The Darkling had put her in that position for his own gain, and now he had raised her out of it. She would never again have to bend to the whim of the king and queen or wear a servant's colors. But David had regrets, and if he did, maybe others did too. Maybe there would be more when the Darkling unleashed the Shadowfold's power, though by then it might be too late. My thoughts were interrupted by Ivan's arrival at the entrance to my tent. Up, he commanded. He wants to see you. My stomach twisted nervously, but I got up and followed him. As soon as we stepped out of the tent, we were flanked by guards who escorted us the short distance to the Darkling's quarters. When they saw Ivan, the Alprich Nicky at the entryway stepped aside. Ivan nodded toward the tent. Go on, he said with a smirk. I desperately wanted to smack that knowing look right off his face. Instead, I lifted my chin and strode past him. The heavy silk slid close behind me and I took a few steps forward, then paused to get my bearings. The tent was large and lit by dimly glowing lamps. The floor was covered in rugs and furs, and at its center burned a fire that crackled in a large silver dish. High above it, a flap in the roof of the tent allowed the smoke to escape and showed a patch of the night sky. The Darkling sat in a large chair, his long legs sprawled out before him, staring into the fire, a glass in his hand and a bottle of kvass on the table beside him. Without looking at me, he gestured to the chair across from him. I walked over to the fire, but I did not sit. He glanced at me with faint exasperation and then looked back into the flames. Sit down, Alina. I perched on the edge of the chair, watching him warily. Speak, he said. I was starting to feel like a dog. I have nothing to say. I imagine you have a great deal to say. If I tell you to stop, you won't stop. If I tell you you're mad, you won't believe me. Why should I bother? Because maybe you want the boy to live? All of the breath went out of me and I had to stifle a sob. Mal was alive. The Darkling might be lying, but I didn't think so. He loved power, and Mal's life gave him power over me. Tell me what to say to save him, I whispered, leaning forward. Tell me, and I'll say it. He's a traitor and a deserter. He's the best tracker you have or ever will have. Possibly, said the Darkling with an indifferent shrug. But I knew him better now, and I saw the flicker of greed in his eyes as he tilted his head back to empty his glass of kvass. I knew what it cost him to think of destroying something he might acquire and use. I press this small advantage. You could exile him, send him north to the permafrost until you need him. You'd have him spend the rest of his life in a work camp or a prison? I swallowed the lump in my throat. Yes. You think you'll find a way to him, don't you? He asked, his voice bemused. You think that somehow, if he's alive, you'll find a way. He shook his head and gave a short laugh. I've given you power beyond all dreaming, and you can't wait to run off and keep house for your tracker. I knew I should stay silent, play the diplomat, but I couldn't help myself. You haven't given me anything. You've made me a slave. That's never what I intended, Alina. He ran a hand over his jaw, his expression fatigued, frustrated, human. How much of it was real and how much was pretense? I couldn't take chances, he said, not with the power of the stag, not with Ravka's future hanging in the balance. Don't pretend this is about Ravka's welfare. You lied to me. You've been lying to me since the moment I met you. His long fingers tightened around the glass. Did you deserve my trust, he asked, and for once his voice was less than steady and cold. Bagra whispers a few accusations in your ear, and off you go. Did you ever stop to think of what it would mean for me, for all of Ravka, if you just disappeared? You didn't give me much choice. Of course you had a choice, and you chose to turn your back on your country and everything that you are. That isn't fair. Fairness, he laughed. Still, she talks of fairness. What does fairness have to do with any of this? The people curse my name and pray for you, but you're the one who is ready to abandon them. I'm the one who will give them power over their enemies. I'm the one who will free them from the tyranny of the king. And give them your tyranny in return. Someone has to lead, Alina. Someone has to end this. Believe me, I wish there were another way. He sounded so sincere, so reasonable, less a creature of relentless ambition than a man who believed he was doing the right thing for his people. Despite all he'd done and all he intended, I did almost believe him. Almost. I gave a single shake of my head. He slumped back in his chair. Fine, he said with a weary shrug. Make me your villain. He set his empty glass down and stood. Come here. Fear shot through me, but I made myself rise and closed the distance between us. He steadied me in the firelight. He reached out and touched Morotes of his collar, letting his long fingers spread over the rough bone, then slide up my neck to cradle my face with one hand. I felt a jolt of revulsion, but I also felt the sure, intoxicating force of him. 
I hated that it still had an effect on me. You betrayed me, he said softly. I wanted to laugh. I betrayed him? He had used me, seduced me, and now enslaved me, and I was the betrayer? But I thought of Mal and swallowed my anger and my pride. Yes, I said. I'm sorry for that. He laughed. You're not sorry for any of it. The only thought you have is for the boy and his miserable life. I said nothing. Tell me, he said, his grip tightening painfully, his fingertips pressing into my flesh. In the firelight, his gaze looked unfathomably bleak. Tell me how much you love him. Beg for his life. Please, I whispered, fighting the tears that welled in my eyes. Please spare him. Why? Because the collar can't give you what you want, I said recklessly. I had only one thing with which to bargain, and it was so little, but I pressed on. I have no choice but to serve you, but if Mal comes to harm, I will never forgive you. I will fight you any way that I can. I will spend every waking minute looking for a way to end my life, and eventually I'll succeed. But show him mercy, let him live, and I will serve you gladly. I will spend the rest of my days proving my gratitude. I nearly choked out the last word. He cocked his head to one side, a small, skeptical smile playing about his lips. Then the smile disappeared, replaced by something I didn't recognize, something that looked almost like longing. Mercy. He said the word as if he were tasting something unfamiliar. I could be merciful. He raised his other hand to cut my face and kissed me softly, gently, and though everything in me rebelled, I let him. I hated him. I feared him. But still I felt the strange tug of his power, and I couldn't stop the hungry response of my own treacherous heart. He pulled away and looked at me. Then, his eyes still locked on mine, he called for Ivan. Take her to the cells, the darkling said when Ivan appeared in the doorway of the tent. Let her see her tracker. A sliver of hope entered my heart. Yes, Alina, he said, stroking my cheek. I can be merciful. He leaned forward, pulling me close, his lips brushing my ear. Tomorrow we enter the shadow fold, he whispered, his voice like a caress. And when we do, I will feed your friend to the Volcra, and you will watch him die. No, I cried, recoiling in horror. I tried to pull away from him, but his grip was like steel, his fingers digging into my skull. You said, you may say your goodbyes tonight. This is all the mercy traitors deserve. Something broke loose inside me. I lunged at him, clawing at him, screaming my hate. Ivan was on me in moments, holding me tight as I thrashed and strained in his arms. Murderer, I shouted. Monster. All of those things. I hate you, I spat. He shrugged. You'll tire of hate soon enough. You'll tire of everything. He smiled then, and behind his eyes I saw the same bleak and yawning chasm I had seen in Bagra's ancient gaze. You will wear that collar for the rest of your very, very long life, Alina. Fight me as long as you're able. You will find I have far more practice with eternity. He waved his hand dismissively, and Ivan pulled me from the tent and down the path, still struggling. A sob tore loose from my throat. The tears I had fought to hold back during my conversation with the Darkling gave way and streamed unchecked down my cheeks. Stop that, Ivan whispered furiously. Someone will see you. I don't care. The Darkling was going to kill Mal anyway. What difference did it make who saw my misery now? The reality of Mal's death and the Darkling's cruelty were staring me in the face, and I saw the stark and horrible shape of things to come. Ivan yanked me into my tent and gave me a rough shake. Do you want to see the tracker or not? I'm not going to march a weeping girl through camp. I pressed my hands against my eyes and stifled my sobs. Better, he said. Put this on. He tossed me a long brown cloak. I slipped it over my kefta and he yanked the large hood up. Keep your head down and stay quiet or I swear I'll drag you right back here and you can say your goodbyes on the fold. Understand? I nodded. We followed an unlit path that skirted the perimeter of the camp. My guards kept their distance, walking far ahead and far behind us, and I quickly realized that Ivan did not want anyone to recognize me or to know I was visiting the jail. As we walked between the barracks and tents, I could sense a strange tension crackling through the camp. The soldiers we passed seemed jumpy, and a few glared at Ivan with blatant hostility. I wondered how the First Army felt about the Operat's sudden rise to power. The jail was located on the far side of camp. It was an older building, clearly from a time predating the barracks that surrounded it. Board guards flanked the entrance. New prisoner, one of them asked Ivan, a visitor. Since when do you escort visitors to the cells? Since tonight, Ivan said, a dangerous edge to his voice. The guards exchanged a nervous glance and stepped aside. No need to get antsy, blood butter. Ivan led me down a hallway lined with mostly empty cells. I saw a few ragged men, a drunk snoring soundly on the floor of his cell. At the end of the hall, Ivan unlocked a gate, and we descended a set of rickety stairs to a dark, windowless room lit by a single guttering lamp. 
In the gloom, I could make out the heavy iron bars of the room's only cell and, sitting slumped by its far wall, its only prisoner. Mal, I whispered. In seconds, he was on his feet and we were clinging to each other through the iron bars, our hands clasped tightly together. I couldn't stop the sobs that shook me. Shh, it's okay, Alina, it's okay. You have the night, said Ivan, and disappeared back up the stairs. When we heard the outer gate clang shut, Mal turned to me. His eyes roved over my face. I can't believe he let you come. Fresh tears spilled over my cheeks. Mal, he let me come because... When? he asked hoarsely. Tomorrow, on the Shadowfold. He swallowed, and I could see him struggle with the knowledge, but all he said was, All right. I let out a sound that was half laugh, half sob. Only you could contemplate imminent death and just say, All right. He smiled at me and pushed the hair back from my tear-stained face. How about, Oh no. Mal, if I'd been stronger, if I'd been stronger, I would have driven a knife through your heart. Well, I wish you had, I muttered. Well, I don't. I looked down at her clasped hands. Mal, what the Darkling said in the glade about, about him and me? I didn't, I never, it doesn't matter. I looked up at him. It doesn't? No, he said a little too fiercely. I don't think I believe you. So maybe I don't believe it yet either. Not completely, but it's the truth. He clutched my hands more tightly, holding them close to his heart. I don't care if you dance naked on the roof of the little palace with him. I love you, Alina, even the part of you that loved him. I wanted to deny it, to erase it, but I couldn't. Another sob shook me. I hate that I ever thought, that I ever... Do you blame me for every mistake I made? For every girl I tumbled? For every dumb thing I've said? Because if we start running tallies on stupid, you know who's going to come out ahead. No, I don't blame you. I managed a small smile. Much. He grinned and my heart flip-flopped the way it always had. We found our way back to each other, Alina. That's what matters. He kissed me through the bars, the cold iron pressing against my cheek as his lips met mine. We stayed together that last night. We talked about the orphanage, the angry rasp of Anya Kuya's voice, the taste of stolen cherry cordial, the smell of the new-mown grass in our meadow, how we'd suffered in the heat of summer and sought out the cool comfort of the music room's marble floors, the journey we'd made together on the way to do our military service, the Suli violins we'd heard our first night away from the only home either of us could remember. I told him the story of the day I'd been mending pottery with one of the maids in the kitchen at Karamzin, waiting for him to return from one of the hunting trips that had taken him from home more and more frequently. I'd been fifteen, standing at the counter, vainly trying to glue together the jagged pieces of a blue cup. When I saw him crossing the fields, I ran to the doorway and waved. He caught sight of me and broke into a jog. I had crossed the yard to him slowly, watching him draw closer, baffled by the way my heart was skittering around in my chest. Then he'd picked me up and spun me in a circle, and I'd clung to him, breathing in his sweet, familiar smell, shocked by how much I'd missed him. Dimly, I'd been aware that I still had a shard of the blue cup in my hand, that it was digging into my palm, but I didn't want to let go. When he finally set me down and ambled off to the kitchen to find his lunch, I had stood there, my palm dripping blood, my head still spinning, knowing that everything had changed. Anakuya had scolded me for getting blood on the clean kitchen floor. She'd bandaged my hand and told me it would heal, but I knew it would just go on hurting. In the creaking silence of the cell, Mal kissed the scar on my palm, the wound made so long ago by the edge of that broken cup, a fragile thing I'd thought beyond repair. We fell asleep on the floor, cheeks pressed together through the bars, hands clasped tight. I didn't want to sleep. I wanted to savor every last moment with him. But I must have dozed off because I dreamed again of the stag. This time, Mal was beside me in the glade, and it was his blood in the snow. The next thing I knew, I was waking up to the sound of the gate being opened above us and Ivan's footsteps on the stairs. Mal had made me promise not to cry. He said it would only make it harder on him. So I swallowed my tears. I kissed him one last time and let Ivan lead me away.